Hello everyone and welcome back. One of the requests that I had when I was doing the series of explained talks was um, to discuss about pterygium, which is a fairly common pathology that all of us see almost every day in our patients. And um, you know, this is what today's lecture is going to be about. I'm going to take you through why a pterygium occurs in the first place, what it's its essential pathological nature. Um, how does it differ from uh, other similar pathologies, typically a pseudoterygium or a recurrent pterygium? And why, uh, when a pterygium is excised, uh, it records? What is the process, the mechanism? And therefore, by understanding that, how can we do pterygium surgery so that we can minimize the recurrences? So, that's going to be the flow of the talk today. So let's begin by understanding why a pterygium occurs in the first place. Now, there is pretty much broad consensus on the fact that the pterygium is a subepithelial regeneration of the conjunctiva, which means that the epithelium overlying the pterygium is more or less normal. It's not pathological, unlike say, um, ocular surface commerce neoplasia or OSSN, where it's essentially an epithelial uh, neoplasia or dysplasia. In um, pterygium, it's all subepithelium. So the epithelium overlying the pterygium, if you can see this top panel, is normal. Whether it is corneal or conjunctival, doesn't matter, the epithelium is normal. So most of the pathology is restricted to the subepithelial, substantia propria of the conjunctiva. And the pathognomonic sign that you see in, um, in, in, in a primary pterygium uh, is elastotic degeneration, what you see over here in this double asterisk. And uh, typically, uh, this elastotic degeneration is seen in uh, very commonly because of age-related changes uh, or UV exposure-related changes on the skin. So uh, freckles, which people develop as a result of old age or of uh, chronic sun exposure, also demonstrates this exact, almost very, very similar uh, change in the uh, uh, epidermis of the uh, of the skin and therefore this is this gave rise to the theory that uh, a similar change must be causing the pterygium in the eye as well because of the similarities in the pathological appearance so the most accepted theory today um, about a pterygium pathogenesis is uv exposure so because of the way that the UV light falls on the eye, that it is focused in certain areas of the conjunctiva, it leads to a damage in the limbal stem cells, in the subconjunctival tissue, and that leads to a progressive uh, freckling of the conjunctiva in that area. And because the limbal stem cells are also damaged, the corneal limbal barrier cannot be maintained, and therefore the conjunctiva slowly overgrows the um, the cornea. Now, um, over here in the UV theory, um, one of the things that is mentioned is the reason that the pterygium or one of the evidences that supports this theory is because the nose blocks out the UV rays, uh, you know, that would otherwise, when they're focused, when they pass through, the light passes through the cornea and, and is focused on the temporal limbus, is um, uh, is blocked by the nose, therefore the pterygium is much more common nasally because temporarily we don't have any protection for the UV rays as they're coming in and getting focused on the nasal part of the conjunctiva. So that is a kind of a circumstantial or corroborative evidence which uh, supports the UV light mediated theory of pathogenesis of pterygium. That because there is more access on the temporal side, the light including the UV rays uh, fall on the temporal limbus are focused as they pass through the cornea and concentrate uh, on the nasal limbus and the nasal conjunctiva and that is where the degeneration occurs. Now anatomically if you look at a pterygium it has various parts. The uh, part that overlies the cornea is known as the head of the pterygium or the part which is actually progressing towards the cornea is known as the head of the pterygium. And this small um, isthmus between the head, which is overlying the cornea, and the body, which is the rest of the pterygium, which is on over, 
over the sclera on the conjunctiva, um, this junction is known as the neck. Okay, and typically, if you pay attention, you will also be able to see the elastosis uh, when it is very dense as these whitish deposits under the conjunctival epithelium. Uh, sometimes they're very densely packed and so they're easy to make out as in this photograph. Sometimes it's more diffuse and therefore you will not be able to appreciate with the naked eye. The other change that is typically associated with a primary or even a recurrent regime, actually is more exaggerated in a recurrent regime, is the dragging of the semilunar fold. So this semilunar fold is supposed to be uh, at the medial canthus, but when the pterygium uh, progresses over the cornea, it kind of drags the semilunar fold temporarily with it. And this is the typical appearance. I'm of course showing you a nasal pterygium. Um, you wouldn't have the semilunar fold if you had a temporal or a double-headed pterygium, but the changes are similar when you have a double-headed or an isolated temporal pterygium. One of the things that you should look for and uh, be wary of are pterygia which are located in other anatomical positions or locations. So um, you typically would expect uh, a pterygium to be nasal, almost 90% of it is always nasal, otherwise temporal or double-headed. Pterygia in other locations, for example superior or inferior, are very very uh, rare, they are not normal and it should immediately raise the flag of suspicion in your head that something else is going on. So the chances of that being a pseudoterygium or a symblepheron uh, because of some other pathology, either injury or progressive subconjunctival inflammatory disorders like pemphigoid are quite likely if the pterygium is in other locations like superiorly or you know, superotemporally or inferiorly etc. Now, like I said, the main pathognomonic change in pterygia uh, is elastosis, sub-epithelial uh, elastosis in the substantia propria. And you can see this uh, on clinical examination, sometimes when it is a very uh, fresh and fleshy pterygium, progressive pterygium, it can be easily seen accumulating beyond the neck on the head of the, under the head of the pterygium. You can also pick it up on uh, OCT. I'm just showing this for academic interest, but because this material, the elastotic material is very dense, you know, it blocks out the light. So it absorbs all the incident light and you can see the back shadowing in the OCT. So you basically see darkness beyond that point because it is light absorbed. And uh, if you do a routine histopathology and here there is a periodic acid skiff stain section that I'm showing you, you can see this dense elastosis. You can see this uh, as this almost, uh, uh, you know, densely packed abnormal material that you see in the substantia propria with overlying blood vessels and a little bit of inflammation, etc. Some inflammation um, uh, is associated, but it is typically not a, uh, you know, inflammatory disorder like a uh, similar front in a chemical burn or a uh, conjunctival shortening, foreshortening that we see in pemphigoid. okay? So some amount of inflammation is there, but it's quite mild compared to conjunctival inflammatory disorder. So you can see in this section also, um, two different types of elastosis. On top, you have the typical kind of grainy elastosis, which is uh, more commonly seen on histopathological section. Here, the pterygium has been excised in the manner. Typically, you know, this dense elastotic material is deep down within the head of the pterygium. When you excise it, it remains stuck to the cornea. So typically you don't see this dense elastosis in the histopathological section, but this pterygium I have excised, uh, uh, you know, with that in mind so that this is included in the section so that you can see both together and compare the kind of a granular elastosis uh, in the immediate sub-epithelial region and the more deeper, more dense elastosis that you can actually visibly see as the white opacity under the head of the tree. Now I mentioned this before and I'll tell you this again because it's very, very important to recognize is what is not a pterygium. So when you see an unusual location, when you see associated uh, keratin deposition on top of the pterygium like lesion, when it is associated with dry eyes, when there is excessive pigmentation or irregular surface. And if you have access to an OCT, if you can take a line scan through uh, the 
pterygium and you see abnormal epithelial morphology. These are pointers that indicate that this is not a typical case of primary or recurrent pterygium. All right. So unusual location, if it's not nasal or pterygium, if it is located superiorly, superior temporally or inferiorly. Pigmentation, if there's excessive pigmentation on the surface of the lesion or anywhere, feeder vessels, large, very uh, prominent feeder, tortuous feeder vessels, associated dry eyes, uh, and irregularity of the surface that you would otherwise not expect with a pterygium, and also abnormal epithelial morphology. So please remember these points, which point to an alternate diagnosis. Here I'm showing you uh, an OCT section, and this is what I mentioned before, how that can help you in making the distinction. On your left, the panels on the top and the bottom are of a pterygium, and you can see here, this is what typical primary nasal pterygium looks like. On the OCT, it clearly shows you that the hyporeflective epithelium is normal, in more thickness and morphology, and all this pathology is sub-epithelial. You can see the folds, you can see the, um, you know, the presence of the, um, the material, the uh, elastotic material, which is backshadowing and so on and so forth. But overall, you can see that the epithelium is normal and whatever pathology is there, parts of it is hyperreflective, parts of it is hyperreflective, is present under the epithelium. Whereas on your right is a case of a squamous neoplasia or dysplasia, where you can see that the pathology is completely epithelium, sub-epithelial sub tissue is normal. So you can see, if you see the continuity of the epithelium from the corneal surface, and as you trace it back, you see that this is, there is a thickening, and this is all epithelium. There is no sub-epithelial uh, problem in the lamina propria or substantia propria. Now, what are the indications? It's fairly common, about 10% of the world's population has uh, either a nasal or a temporal pterygium. And therefore, the question basically is, when would you consider treating this condition? Um, so uh, typically, if you look at uh, textbooks, they'll mention that visual loss from proximity to the visual axis. So if the pterygium grows over, so it is covering the visual axis, that's one indication. Or it's threatening to cover the visual axis. There is uh, some amount of loss of best corrected vision from irregular astigmatism or high astigmatism. There is a movement restriction of the eye. This typically happens in recurrent pterygia, not in primary pterygia. Atypical appearance, such as possible dysplasia, where you want to do maybe an excision biopsy to see what is going on. Uh, you have actually seen the pterygia progress in recent times. You know, there's documented progression, either noted by the ophthalmologist or observed by the patient. Also, if you see symptoms like irritation, watering, recurrent redness, and so on and so forth. Patients often also complain of itching because of the presence of eosinophils within the, uh, within the lesion. And of course, cosmetic concerns. But I will tell you this from a personal experience that the, uh, you know, although this is the order of indications that is listed by any standard textbook, most patients uh, come uh, or seeking cure for a pterygium or asking for a excision if possible for either symptomatic relief because of recurrent redness and the ungainly appearance, and it is mostly because of cosmetic. So mostly the patients are, you know, uh, concerned cosmetically. They don't like this lesion that is there on their eye. It, it makes them, uh, and particularly in today's day and age, with everybody being very concerned about how they look and how their photographs appear, uh, you know, how their selfies look like, uh, it is a problem. And that is the main reason. There are also sometimes people who come in for the pterygium to be removed because it is required by their profession for their corneas to look normal and so on and so forth. So, that, so I would say that about uh, at least two thirds of indications are because of cosmetic reasons uh, and uh, because of uh, symptoms from the pterygium. And in some cases, because of the threat or the fear that the pterygium may progress over the cornea. So there is some amount of um, apprehension that the pterygium was much smaller before, the lesion was much smaller before, and now it's becoming more uh, whiter or is growing uh, or gradually uh, growing more over the cornea and so on and so forth. Now, if you look at what is the treatment, we know that there are hardly any um, medical therapies that are there for pterygium. Uh, several things have been tried, but nothing has really uh, stood the test of uh, time or uh, can be said to be an accepted treatment. And the treatment for pterygium is surgery or surgical excision or removal. The main challenge uh, from, for surgical excision is recurrence. So if you read over here and any, any um, uh, textbook or article will tell you this is a threat 
of recurrence. And therefore, recurrence is, is such a concern in the treatment of pterygium that a lot of people uh, will not uh, surgically intervene in a patient with a pterygium early on when the patient only has symptoms and cosmetic concern because they cannot guarantee a recurrence-free surgery. And that is, I think, uh, one part of uh, one of the issues that I want to address with this talk is how you can do surgery to make sure that there is no recurrence. And we can do that by understanding why this happens. So you have to understand that recurrence is the main concern in pterygium surgery. If there was no recurrence, then people would be doing way more pterygia or, or excising way more pterygia than they do right now. It is just that this is what is holding us back because uh, you know uh, we don't know if we can give a recurrence-free outcome. So what we have covered so far is the fact that the pterygium is a benign degenerative lesion. The main issue is cosmetic blemish. There can be symptoms also. There can be you know, very advanced forms where the vision is affected because of actual physical blockade or of high astigmatism, but they are very uncommon cosmetic blemish symptoms, group, uh, you know, uh, a, a rapid growth or, or uh, progressive growth. These are typically the, uh, the problems. Uh, we know that there is no medical prophylaxis or therapy, that surgical excision is the only known treatment. And the main problem or issue with surgical excision is recurrence. The reason why people are so concerned about recurrence, you can ask, is okay, fine, if it recurs, you know, we do the surgery again. This is so common in so many other, um, even, you know, ophthalmological conditions where you give a treatment, the problem comes back, then you treat it again. So what is the big deal? The big deal is that uh, the recurrence is usually much, much more difficult to treat than the primary. And that is why, especially in, um, in, a, in, a, in a case of pterygium, you would avoid a uh, recurrence if possible. So what is a recurrent pterygium? That is the question that we will address next. And uh, a recurrent pterygium essentially is very different from a primary pterygium. This is also something that uh, needs to be understood if you are going to truly treat the pterygium in a way that it does not recur. Uh, if you, uh, again, go through the histopathological descriptions of uh, pterygium and recurrent pterygium, it is clearly noted that the primary and recurrent pterygia are two distinct entities and the recurrent pterygium is composed of only fibrovascular tissue in the absence of elastoid degeneration. Okay. And it may, in severe cases, involve the adjoining tissue like episclera, sclera, the rectus muscle, sheet, even the corneal stoma, and is very firmly adherent to the underlying structures. So, pathologically, these are two different conditions. One is uh, a elastotic degeneration, and the other is a fibrotic reaction. So this is recurrent pterygium. Um, you can see on the photograph and you can see on the histopathology. Typically, this is how the uh, histopathology appearance of the excised uh, recurrent pterygium specimen will look like. And mostly you see that you have, uh, you know, hypertrophic or maybe uh, hyperplastic epithelium in various areas. But most of the lesion is composed of uh, just a fibrotic response. Fibrotic response means you have blood vessels, you have inflammatory cells pouring out of those blood vessels into the interstitium and that you also have a deposition of a lot of granulation tissue, which means abnormal collagen deposited over there because uh, uh, of, you know, uh, this all this pinkish granulation tissue, which is a normal response uh, to any inflammatory uh, reaction or, or part of an inflammatory reaction. So basically this is chronic inflammation, granulation, fibrosis. That's what a recurrent pterygium is uh, all about. Whereas, uh, and this is a slightly high resolution photograph showing you the same, you have the inflammatory cells, you have the large dilated blood vessels, uh, and you have the, uh, you have the uh, fibrotic granulation tissue that has been deposited. Whereas the primary pterygium, like we mentioned before, has very little inflammation and fibrosis that, that you can see in the, uh, within the tissue, it is mostly this, elastotic degeneration, which is the pathognomonic feature of a primary tissue. Uh, so the question therefore arises that if it is not true recurrence of the same pathology, you know, so what I want to do here is to take a minute and try to contrast between true recurrence 
and perceived recurrence. So if pathologically this is not recurrence of the same problem, why is it being called a recurrence? It is being called a recurrence because morphologically, when you see it with your naked eye or look at it, look at the lesion on a slit lamp, a primary and a recurrent lesion look very similar. Okay, so the recurrence that, that people are talking about is, you know, you had a fleshy growth at the corner of your eye, it was stripped off or it was removed, but it came back and, and now it looks much worse. So that's why it's called a recurrence because it's a, uh, it's a, it's a morphological recurrence. Okay, but actually pathological, it's not. Uh, so I want to contrast it from, let's say, recurrence of a tumor or, 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 or a neoplasia where we say, you know, somebody had uh, uh, had some uh, some form of cancer and was given uh, you know had surgical excision or was given chemotherapy or radiotherapy or immunotherapy and the cancer recurred. But that is the more, most common context, unfortunately, in which we use the word recurrence. Uh, but this is this is not that. This is a completely different uh, problem. You have a surgical excision which uh, then has uh, excessive amount of a fibrotic reaction, but morphologically or clinically it looks the same so it is a it is a uh, morphological recurrence not a pathological recurrence uh, this is what you have to clearly understand okay why the reason that you have to clearly understand is therefore if it is not a uh, recurrence of the same pathology it means that it is related more to the surgical trauma than the uv radiation okay so therefore there is no point in giving patients uh, you know, UV protected glasses or telling them that, you know, avoid uh, UV radiation because that might lead to the tritium coming back again. That is not what is happening. Okay. And in the same way, you might find it as a convenient excuse to tell the patient, oh, your tritium record because you went out in the sun, but that is absolutely not true. That is not why the tritium came back. Okay. Uh, because it is a completely different problem that is happening over here. Now, what is, what is causing the recurrence? Now, like I showed you in the previous slide, it is the iatrogenic surgical trauma that causes the recurrence. So when we remove the pterygium by simple excision, which is what people used to do before, bare sclera excision, then there is an exuberant fibrotic response and laying down of granulation tissue as a secondary form of wound healing in that area which is damaged, which now leads to what you can call a fibrotic uh, granulation tissue under the conjunctiva, which is very, very similar to what a simblephron looks like. And that is what a recurrent pterygium is. All right. So primary excision leading to a large wound and this wound, instead of healing through uh, primary intention, heals through secondary intention, leads to vessels growing in, granulation tissue being laid down and the epithelium then coming and covering it, leading to a simblephron-like uh, situation Oh, and this is so recurrent pterygia is actually more similar or closer to a um, to a pseudo pterygium than a primary pterygium is. Okay, so now that we understand why a pterygium is recurring, now that we have addressed uh, the elephant in the room, which is that uh, the problem with pterygium recurrence is not because of 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 repeated UV exposure and again laying down of the elastotic fibrotic tissue, but rather it is an excessive uh, uh, wound healing response that leads to fibrosis and recurrence and it's a morphological recurrence and not a pathological recurrence. Once these things have been understood, the question that we need to address is how do we then prevent the fibrosis? So we are only talking about this in the context of where you're going, you have decided for whatever reason to treat the disease. And you want to remove it, you want to give the patient a good cosmetic outcome and if the good cosmetic outcome is only going to last if the pterygium does not recur. So that's basically what we're talking about. So how do we prevent the excessive fibrosis, which is the cause of recurrence or which is the cause of a recurrent pterygium? We should not say cause of recurrence because it is, as we dis discussed before, not a true recurrence. So what is the cause of a recurrent pterygium? Because that's a terminology. So you have two things that uh, can cause this fibrosis. One is a surface defect. So the removal of the pterygium leads, uh, leaves a large defect on the ocular surface where the sclera is exposed. And therefore, obviously, you will expect that there will be a fibrotic response from the, uh, from the surrounding tissue which will try to cover this. And that is where your, um, you know, um, your granulation tissue comes from. So 
First is to address the surface defect. We can do this by simply covering the defect with something that will uh, delay or reduce or in some way control the fibrotic reaction. So this can be done by applying a conjunctival graft, an amniotic membrane graft, a mucous membrane graft or any other tissue like people have tried pericardium and even temporal, temporal dysfunction. So one is to cover the defect, all right? And the second is to prevent excessive fibrosis by using antifibrotics. So you can use mitomycin C, you can use 5-fluorouracil, people have used thiotepa, they've used beta irradiation, and of course, steroids. So the point is that if the surface defect is adequately covered and if excessive fibrosis is mitigated, then you can prevent the recurrence of the pterygium. Uh, but what we know from established published studies and meta-analysis and so on and so forth, that adequate excision with conjunctival coverage itself has best outcomes. So actually, if you remove the tissue, the pathological uh, primary pterygium, and cover the Bayes sclera with a nice physiological conjunctival graph. Now, why is the conjunctiva? the best graft in this situation because it's physiological because that is the tissue that you are you're removing abnormal conjunctiva and replacing it with normal conjunctiva and that is why it gives the best cosmetic outcomes and it also gives the best uh, functional outcomes so actually adequate excision with conjunctival coverage has repeatedly been shown in many studies to have the best outcomes in terms of the lowest recurrence rates and these recurrence rates are less than 10 percent between uh, in the range of 5 to 10 percent and uh, it has also been shown and this is very very important that including limbus so therefore doing a conjunctival limbal autograph instead of a, just a conjunctival autograph has really no advantage in the treatment of primary pterygium. okay so you have to remember this so just covering the surface defect adequately with the most physiological tissue and the farther you move from this physiology the more will be the recurrence rate so the conjunctiva does the best the amniotic membrane does a much worse than the conjunctiva. It is better than Bayes sclera, but the recurrence rates in just doing an amniotic membrane coverage of the Bayes sclera is close to 30 to 50 percent, which is actually quite high. Whereas if you just leave the Bayes sclera, then the recurrence rates are almost 100 percent at one year. It is also important to understand that a true recurrence rate can only be calculated about one year from surgery. So if you look at the outcome at uh, you know one month or six weeks. That's almost great in any procedure. But we are, what we are talking about is the actual success rates one year or you know uh, many months out, at least more than six months out. That is when you will truly know whether there is recurrence or not. And then if you add uh, any of the antifibrotics to this, you will have slightly better outcomes than what, would you, what you would have with the graft itself. So you can do a conjunctival autograft with them, uh, mitomycin C, or you can do a conjunctal autograph with 5-FU. However, for a primary pterygium, uh, it has been shown, and I think that it has been shown uh, without too much of a doubt, that uh, antifibrotics are really not necessary. They are more useful when you are treating a um, recurrent pterygium or a similar problem. So if the defect is covered well, then adjunctive treatment with antifibrotics is really not necessary. So I'll take you through how I do a pterygium surgery and then I'll take you step by step through uh, each of the uh, you know surgical steps to explain what I'm doing and how I'm doing and uh, then uh, I will finish with some you know just summarize what we have learned from this talk now a few things that I do you know you're mostly talking about again pterygium is something that occurs almost 99.9 percent .9 of the time in adults so we're talking about mostly young adults who are cosmetically or symptomatically concerned about a flesh progressive pterygium these are patients who you i will usually not give a perivalvular block i will usually just um, you know uh, put topical anesthesia uh, i use preservative free lidocaine and i also use uh, uh, some vasoconstrictor eye drops like brimonidine before surgery, usually 10 minutes before shifting the patient to the table and um, one drop when the patient has been draped and that usually provides some amount of vasoconstriction that really reduces the amount of bleeding you would have otherwise. However, you can never really do a bloodless surgery. Uh, 
because the lesion is quite vascular and it is attached uh, quite firmly to the eye at the limbus. So it definitely bleeds uh, quite a lot during surgery. So uh, one of the ways that uh, is helpful is to sit temporarily and operate on a pterygium under topical anesthesia because if you sit, sit temporarily then what happens is the blood keeps draining away from your surgical. When you're sitting superiorly, all the blood is collecting in that area. So sometimes vis visualization or visibility may be a problem. If you're sitting temporarily and operating, then typically what happens is the blood drains away from the surgical area. So that is also useful. So remember topical anesthesia with uh, lidocaine using alpha gant drops for vasoconstriction and sitting temporarily to do the surgery. They're all very useful. The surgery I'm going to show you here is I'm sitting superiorly. Um, however, what is also important is to reduce the, um, the illumination, the intensity of the illumination in your operating scope so that the patient cooperates better. So that's also, so you will see here that on the surface, you can see very few vessels because the patient has already received vasoconstrictor eye drops. Here I've used primonidine. And uh, what I'm going to do here first is take a uh, preservative free lidocaine on a 26 gauge needle and infiltrate the body of the pterygium so that the patient does not feel any pain during surgery. And usually it can do it in a nice painless procedure. I'm using my Vana scissors to excise the uh, superficial layers of the conjunctiva about uh, three or four millimeters away from the limbus because usually this part of the conjunctiva is quite pigmented and folded and you don't want to retain that. And I'll undermine the conge uh, nasally so as to remove the elastobic tissue. And you can visibly make out that this tissue is abnormal. By looking at it, it's quite whitish. And usually I'll pull this and excise, ex excise it. But you will see that also I'm doing the excision at, at a level where you still see tenons underneath. So you're nowhere near the muscle and you don't have to be concerned that you will cut the muscle etc. Then the, the entire pterygium body is peeled off uh, the corneal surface uh, and from the neck at the pterygium. I usually do a little bit of cleanup over here with my non-tooth forceps or 15 number blade measure and then take a conjunctival graft from the superior uh, bulbar conjunctiva by asking the patient to look down. I'll usually use my Vana scissor and uh, put a little bit of marking at the tip of the scissor and use that. Um, as a guide to measure how large the graft is going to be instead of actually using calipers. But you know, you, you can use calipers as well. I'll again infiltrate the graft area. I'll put some more marking on the graft to make sure that I don't lose orientation because I'm going to take a very, very thin graft. It's going to be very thin. It's going to have epithelium and just a little bit of substantia propria, not too much of tenons in your graft. The more tenons you have, the worse is the cosmetic outcome. And you cannot really get a very thin tenons free graft unless you, uh, you know, inject fluid into the conjunctiva and really fluff up the tenons so that you can remove. I'm also going to remove this little bit of excess tenons that I have towards the limbus, do a little bit of dissection over here. And after that, I'm going to have a very slim, very translucent graft that I'm going to attach with fibrin glue and the markings will help me remember which side is which. And after I have attached the uh, autograft to the scleral surface, and this is the bare sclera. I'll make sure that I'll excise that little strip of conge that is overlapping the limbus. And this is again something that people uh, don't pay a lot of attention to. If you want a really good cosmetic outcome, then you have to make sure that the limbus is not covered by your conjunctival autograph. That is what is going to make your conjunctival autograph look really nice in the post-operative period in terms of uh, in terms of the cosmesis, how natural it looks because you want the entire eye to look, the cornea to look circular instead of oval. So the grafting should not lead in the result in the ovalization of the cornea or at least the visible part of the cornea vertically. So um, just taking you through the steps of the surgery again, I'm uh, sitting with low illumination, having put a few drops of brimonidine to achieve some amount of vasoconstriction so that there is not, you know, you don't have so much bleeding during surgery that you, uh, you become flustered and you, and you lose your uh, calm so that you have to make sure that you do that. Infiltrate the body of the pterygium with lignocaine. Some people also use lignocaine with adrenaline, uh, which is also fine. Just make sure that the, there are no contraindications to the use of adrenaline and that you don't inject directly into a vessel that also causes uh, vasoconstriction. But because um, 
use of brimeridine gives me good predictable uh, uh, amount of vasoconstriction. I find that putting adrenaline additionally because it is not as safe uh, does not really give you any additional benefit. Then is to uh, excise. So a lot of people will excise the pterygium at the limbus and not beyond it. I tend to include about uh, three to four millimeters of the conjunctiva. And this is because often in this part of the conjunctiva, there are folds, there's pigmentation, and you don't want to leave that behind because, because again, cosmetically it does not look good. And then in the next step, I will basically pull uh, the, uh, the uh, pathological quinones uh, and undermine the conch kind of nasally to remove as much of the pathological tissue as possible because that really allows the uh, conch to settle back and tells you the true extent of the uh, defect that you need to cover. Otherwise, if you leave some tenons be uh, behind, then the conch doesn't really recess as much as it should and it gives you a false uh, kind of comfort or idea about the amount of defect. So after this has been removed, uh, you can, there are various ways of removing it from the cornea. Usually in fleshy pterygiums, they will peel right off. So mostly I'm operating on these uh, younger patients who have fleshy progressive pterygium. And there the pterygium comes off very easily if you just pull them with two, uh, you know, two forceps. In those patients with atrophic pterygium, very atrophic also they'll come off. Uh, otherwise there might be some amount of additions that you might have to release and might come out easily. So, the point I'm trying to make here is the another advantage of uh, operating under topical anesthesia is that you can ask the patient to adapt and that will give you the true nature of the defect or the true size of the defect in full adduction. If you're operating under perivalvular anesthesia and because the eye is stuck in the primary position, it always gives you a false sense of security or it you basically tend to undersize the graft and post-operatively when you look on the slit lamp and you ask the patient to attack the eye you will see that there's a small sliver of gap between your graft and the nasal conjunctiva this will not happen if you measure the defect in adduction so even operating on peribulbar anesthesia when you are measuring the defect make sure that you forcibly adduct the eye pull it away from the or make the eye turn temporarily when you are measuring the defect. Now, again, the measuring of the defect can be done with calipers. Can I usually use my Vana scissors with the open tips and the uh, measure how many breadths of the open tip the gap is. So usually you, it will be you know three on this side, two on this side, and four on this side, and then take a similar size graft from the superior bulbar conjunctiva. Always make sure that you inflate the superior bulbar conjunctiva with some kind of fluid. Here again use of uh, lignocaine is not necessary uh, but I usually do that so that it gives a kind of a, a, a top-up anesthesia during the course of the surgery because usually it will take between 15 and 20 minutes to complete the surgery and uh, the initial injection that you used uh, may not last that long and sometimes the patient uh, may be in an amount of discomfort but here because it's kind of top-up it uh, gives some more anesthesia to the surface so I will usually instead of just injecting BSS or in the lactate, I'll inject uh, preservative free lidocaine here as well. Always mark your graft so that you don't lose orientation uh, because you're trying to get a graft that is as thin as possible. Sometimes when your graft is so thin and you lay it down on the, on the cornea, which is transparent, it's very difficult to make out which side is which. And it is not uncommon to lose orientation and the markings really help, okay? So mark the surface uh, and then dissect a very thin graft. Uh, here I'm holding the, uh, the dissected part of the graft in my left hand with a non-tooth forcep. You can use either curve tying forcep or a Macpherson's to do that. And then you use your Vana scissors on the other hand to uh, very nicely uh, you know, dissect this graft uh, as superficial as possible without buttonholing and taking as little tenons in the graft as possible. And then you place the graft. Typically for all grafts, uh, you know, these kind of tissue graft, whether it's a mucous membrane or a conjunctiva, I prefer taking a graft that is slightly larger than the defect so that I can cut it to size and fit it within the defect rather than ending up with a graft that is smaller than the defect and then trying to somehow manage to close the defect, which is a much harder thing to do. And as we discussed earlier, if you leave a defect on the ocular surface, the chance that there will be some granulation forming at that site is high. And you don't want that because that granulation can easily lead to a partial record. So you can get a very good outcome in the area where the graft is, but you can see that the recurrence happening around it where you left a small bare sclerotic.
and always rem remember to remove this uh, strip of tissue that um, um, that covers the limbus so uh, the problem is that in an, a pathological limbus you can't really see the limbus so remember that uh, beyond the uh, gray cornea and the white sclera there's about a millimeter of limbal tissue over here so just eyeball it and make sure that that is not covered by the conjunctival bra uh, because normally what happens is that the conjunctiva merges into the limbus and the limbus merges into the cornea so there is about a millimeter and a half of limbus all around 360 degree in a normal eye and uh, the conjunctiva should only start beyond that so when we put a conjunctival graft we tend to put it right at the junction of the cornea and the limbus rather than at the junction of the limbus and the sclera so what i'm basically asking you to do is that the medial edge of your conjunctival graft should be at the junction of the likely position of the limbus and the sclera rather than at the junction of the cornea and the limbus because that is the natural transition so you want that strip to be covered by the corneal epithelium rather than the conjunctival graft and this should be your final position of the graft so you can see here this particular area where the limbus is if you continue if you trace it back you know because over here it's pigmented you can trace here it's all covered by the pterygium so you don't know where the limbus is but if you trace it in continuity this strip of tissue should not be covered by the graft Okay, so normally most many surgeons will put the graft till this point and it looks like there's a little bit of recurrence post-operatively it's not it's just your graft you put it wrong so make sure that it starts from the sclera it doesn't start from the limbus so a uh, advanced form or extreme form of the conjunctival autografting is the perfect technique where a very large excision is done by hooking the rectus etc and a very large graft is put in place and is sutured and over here also if you see what Lawrence Hurst, the Australian surgeon who described this technique is doing uh, and um, this is also very important. You see here that there is a gap between the limbus and where the graft is nasally. Okay, this is basically what I was asking you to do. So there should be this sliver of gap between where the cornea ends and where the sclera begins because this is actually limbus. This is not sclera and this needs to be epitalized from the corneal side and not by the graft. And what they, Lawrence Hurst has described in this technique, which is very, very successful, is to put a very large graft and then suture the graft um, in place. So what happens when you do the perfect technique of surgery is that the graft is so large that, uh, that you can't really uh, see the graft at all when the patient looks in primary position. Okay, so that's basically the trick here. So if you see how this graft is done, the superior edge is covered by the upper lid. The inferior edge of the graft gets covered by the lower lid. There is no nasal edge because here the nasal edge is very cleverly put a couple of millimeters behind the, the cornea. So this gets epithelized from the, the corneal epithelium and there is a very smooth transition over here. And the medial edge or the nasal edge or if it's a temporal pterygium, then the temporal edge is so far out into, uh, you know, uh, into the fornix that it is really not visible even if the patient attacks the eye. So that's the trick of the perfect technique, that very large excision and very large graph. Uh, my suggestion is that it's really not necessary to do this for the kind of expectations that at least the patients that uh, we commonly encounter have. Uh, they're pretty happy if you give them, uh, uh, you know, if you do a less radical excision and grafting. That's been my experience. And uh, however, in Australia, because of the high UV exposure, many patients have very large pterygia and, and multiple recurrences and therefore the perfect technique comes in very handy. So if you had a patient who wanted fantastic cosmesis versus good cosmesis, this is something that is worth considering. But make sure that you have seen somebody do it and you understand the principles behind the perfect technique rather than trying to do something uh, too excessive and then uh, landing up in trouble. So, the, you know, he, he has published very large series with very long outcomes, a number of papers on both primary and recurrent pterygium. And he has incredibly low uh, uh, recurrence rates, uh, which are less than 1%, almost close to zero. So, finally, another point about cosmesis, because I truly honestly believe that pterygium is a cosmetic surgery more than anything else. And therefore, remember the anatomy that we described uh, earlier 
in our uh, when I be began the talk in, in describing the parts of the pterygium. So you have to make sure that there is nothing on the cornea. The cornea is clear, and you also have to make sure that the semilunar fold has gone back into position. So this is the same patient after the grafting, which shows the semilunar fold has now gone back to the medial canthus. The limbus is nicely exposed, and uh, you know the cornea is nice and circular, and the area where the pterygium was is now covered with normal tissue rather than pathology. Uh, if you leave tenons intact at your donor site, now this is something sometimes we don't pay attention to. It really helps in normal healing uh, without any consequence. If you take too much of tenons in your graft, not only is your grafted area cosmetically uh, looks bad because all the vessels in the tenons get, get filled, get reperfused, and it looks, you have very abnormal vascularization in the area, and you'll say, oh, I did such a nice surgery, but now I don't know where this large vessel came from. And you know there will typically be a one large dilated vessel that will make the graft look red, and that typically happens when you have too much of tenons in your graft. Um, and the other thing that can happen is the because you have taken a, uh, you can you have removed too much tissue from the donor area, it can heal by secondary intention and cause a granuloma here. These granulomas are not difficult to treat. You can give a subconjunctival, just a dexamethasone injection, or just give the patient uh, frequent topical steroids, and the granulation tissue will will, will go away. Otherwise, you can excise and replace with the conjunctive graft or an amniotic graft. Um, and again, I'm leaving hydrogenic bare sclera either in the donor site or in the grafted site. And as like I said, it's very, very common if you have not measured the defect in adduction or you have left tenons and not created a bare sclera over here uh, and uh, left a gap, then many a times, particularly if the patient is not compliant with the topical steroids post operatively, you can get these large granulomas. In between the graft and the peripheral conjunctival. So, we have now covered almost everything that I wanted to talk about, and uh, I just want to summarize by putting together the tips and tricks to avoid recurrence. Remember that the goal of surgery in treating pterygium above all else is cosmesis, and I really try to think of myself as a cosmetic surgeon trying to improve the appearance of the eye when I'm treating a patient with a pterygium. And that can be done if you know the anatomy, how to put the graft, how to leave the limbus bare, uh, how to make sure that the blending of the normal conjunctiva and the conjunctival graft is as smooth as possible. There are no bare areas that are left behind. And also by understanding that full coverage by conjunctiva is what prevents recurrence. And recurrence will spoil the, the cosmesis, whether it's partial, only in one area, only in one corner, or the entirety of the excised uh, pterygium, any recurrence will eventually spoil the cosmetic outcome of your surgery. So when you're doing the surgery, be gentle, but make sure you have completely removed the pathological tissue. And that is not very difficult to do. If you're operating on patients who have had Pterygium, it's very easy to identify the abnormal tissue which is whitish and uh, has a different appearance and you can just grab it, pull it from another conge and excise without removing, uh, without going anywhere near the muscle because you can pull it towards the limbus and it will come and then cut it rather than cutting it at its, uh, you know, uh, going within the conjunctival tissue to cut it, you can always pull and remove. remove. Remember that when you're harvesting the graft, it has to be appropriately sized, ideally slightly larger than you require, slightly larger, 5%, 10% that you can trim it into size and as thin as possible. Also, adequate coverage of the bare sclera. Remember that you don't leave any bare sclera behind. Always measure the graft size by having the eye in adduction, either in topical anesthesia, asking the patient to look temporarily or turning the eye under uh, topical, uh, under by anesthesia so that you can measure the defect. Uh, so the bare sclera needs to be covered not only in primary gaze, but in full adduction when the eye is rotated temporarily. For I'm talking about a nasal region, of course, and the reverse, vice versa for, for a temporal region. And make sure that there is proper anatomical align alignment of the physiological conjunctival graft, that you don't overlap the limbus. That is going to spoil the cosmesis because the two eyes are going to look different. In one eye, the cornea will look circular. In the other eye, the cornea will look horizontally over and the patient will never be happy with the cosmos. So it's better than what it looked before, but you know, some patients nag. 
And finally, I will finish with this slide on pterygium and cataract. Uh, I will typically, now it's very different from doing a primary pterygium surgery because of a couple of reasons. One is almost everybody who comes in with a combination of a pterygium and a cataract has an atrophic pterygium because they're in their late 50s or their 60s because that's when cataract becomes visually significant. And there, uh, the astigmatism is also quite stable. So unless they're cosmetically concerned, I would not, uh, really uh, think about doing anything about the terrorism uh, because the terrorism has probably been there in their eye for uh, you know a good two or three decades and they are quite uh, adjusted to it and unless they ask for it I'm not going to remove it just make sure that the patient understands you're not operating on the terrorism sometimes the patients feel that since they're undergoing a surgery you'll fix everything at one go or they might also be uh, under the impression that it is the terrorism that is causing the problem you know because of the nomenclature, some of the words or semantics that we use to, to describe cataracts, um, particularly in South India. So that having said, uh, I would usually, because the astigmatism is quite regular and stable, um, I will usually not um, do both together unless the patient asks for it. And if the patient asks for it, I have seen that in atrophic pterygium, removing the pterygium really does not change the astigmatism too much. Uh, if the astigmatism is very high uh, or if you want to be absolutely sure, the best way to do is to do the cataract surgery first, make sure that the keratometry is stable. Uh, I'm sorry, do the pterygium surgery first, make sure that the keratometry has stabilized in about three months and then do the cataract. So I've, I do this, I've done this quite a lot and you can give the patients uh, absolutely, you know, do put, put a toric lens and fix the astigmatism and give them uh, unaided 20 vision. It's quite doable. And uh, in those patients who, uh, in whom you are not aiming for, um, you are not aiming for emetropic correction, the patients are, you know, anyways going to wear some glasses and they're okay with that. In that case, you can do both together. You will hardly get half a cylinder or so in, in kind of atrophic stable terrigiums even after excision. So it won't make too much of a difference. So uh, the caveats that I mentioned before you, uh, decide on combined surgery or staged pterygium followed by cataract surgery is if the patient has cosmetic concerns, many patients I've seen are not worried about it too much. And therefore I would just leave in that in place because the keratometry is very stable and you can give the patient very good unedited outcomes even with the pterygium in place. And uh, just make sure that the patient does not, in that case where you're only going for cataract surgery, just make sure that the patient does not expect that you will take care of the pterygium also doing surgery or uh, you know, when you're doing pterygium only, the patient ex does not expect that the vision will also improve. So those are the things that, of course, your communication with the patient and their attendance should be very clear. And uh, typically, uh, the astigmatism in, uh, in atrophic pterygium is quite regular. But if it is uh, irregular, uh, in that case, you would want to do a pterygium surgery first and see if you can make it more regular uh, or more stable. So that is also another approach. So to summarize, I would say, that in most cases, I would just do a cataract surgery if the patient is not cosmetically concerned. If the patient wants both to be done, then, um, and if the patient is not very, very um, insistent on, um, you know, emetropic unaided vision, I'll do both together. I, if the patient is okay with wearing glasses, I'll just include whatever is the uh, uncalculated for cylinder in the glasses. If the patient is, wants a good cosmetic outcome and uh, an emetropic unaided uh, distance vision or combined distance you're planning to do a multifocal and so on and so forth. In that case, the safest way would be to remove the pterygium, wait for about three months for the keratometry to stabilize and then do um, uh, a cataract surgery with the new keratometry values. So uh, I think we have covered some distance in uh, today's talk and uh, uh, you know, I've, I've done this after a while and I hope that you found this useful. There were a lot of requests for a talk on terrorism and uh, I'm happy uh, to have done this now and I hope that you'll find this useful and please in your in the comment section uh, put down the topics that you want me to talk about the other topics that you want me to talk about and I would definitely uh, try to do that as well. Thank you so much. Stay safe, uh, stay healthy and I will speak to you soon.